what I'm going to do is going through some best practices for setting up audit trails um, in Dynamics GP. We're going to talk a little bit about best practices um, from an audit perspective and then at the end we'll talk from a system perspective um, and go through some of the uh, some of the um, challenges etc. So with that being said um, you know, like Trish said, if there's a question that you would like to ask during the time, there's um, I think there's a raise your hand function, and then at the end we'll unmute and take time for questions and answers. Okay, um, a little bit about me. I am uh, certified in risk and information systems controls. I have uh, 15 years experience with Dynamics G GP. Um, I've been an end user, a consultant, now working with an ISV. So I've um, worn a lot of uh, different hats in regards to Dynamics GP. Um, and hopefully bring a pretty unique perspective in the fact that, um, you know, I've been sitting in many of your chairs at one point or another, um, and so I've had the different experiences from, you know, both a user perspective and um, now working on the side of actually providing an audit trail solution. Um, you know, and my background when I was actually doing GP as an end user um, was assisting companies uh, with their SOX compliance um, uh, uh, two companies in particular were going through IPOs and had to become SOX compliant and um, that's uh, what I was actually brought in for to kind of help set up their security, go through their processes and make make sure that they pass their IT audits, etc. Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, should I use audit trail? And basically, you know, you don't have to use an audit trail tool. Uh, there's no, um, you know, there's no uh, hard and fast rule that says you absolutely need an audit trail tool. However, um, with Dynamics GP, you know, the first question is, are there any other control options? And, you know, there are manual controls, there's process process controls, um, if you could establish um, segregation of duties, et cetera, you might not necessarily need an audit trail, et cetera, but um, out of the box GP, uh, you know, doesn't really have anything built in for specific audit trails. Um, so, you know, there's a question of why would I use audit trails? Well, number one, um, you might want to be able to, you know, uh, put some controls in place where you might not be able to adequately segregate duties. Um, a very good example I use is if somebody has access to create a vendor and they have access to pay that vendor, how do you know that they're not setting up um, false vendors in the system making payments to those vendors and then maybe going and changing some information regarding that vendor to make it look like a legitimate vendor when you can't see what's happening. There's no way to trace that in the system. Um, you know, or if somebody is changing information on a sales order or purchase order, etc. Um, so that might, you know, those, those might be very good legitimate reasons to use an audit trail tool. Why wouldn't I use audit trails? Well, one of the main reasons for not using audit trails, and we're going to talk about this, is you don't need to use audit trails to recreate operational or financial reports that you can get out of the system. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, people get an audit trail tool and they start looking into the functionality and they're like, oh, I can track this and I can track that. So maybe I'm going to create a report that shows me all of the um, write-offs that were done in the system. Well, you can accomplish that using a smart list. So you don't use audit trails to build redundancy um, or build reports that can actually come out of the system via, you know, as a financial or an operational report. That's a very bad use, reason to use audit trails. Um, and there's reasons for that, performance impact, um, you know, who's doing the reviews, et cetera. Uh, one of the other things to consider is this, I need to track everything, right? Um, when we start talking about audit trails and deploying audit trail solutions and talking about, um, you know, when it's appropriate to use audit trails and when it's not, a lot of times people say, well, you know, now that I have this tool, this is great. I want to track everything. I want to see what everybody is doing. Um, I, I, how do I make sure that I'm not missing anything? And, um, you know, how do I make sure that, you know, things are happening in the system that are appropriate, et cetera. But there's a lot of things to consider. And one of the things to consider is you really only want to track things that are actually business critical. Um, you know, and that you can get down to a very granular level with that. So do you necessarily need to track everything? For example, if you look at the vendor card in GP, there's 60 or 70 fields on that vendor card. 
is each one of those business critical? If somebody changes the fax number on the vendor card, is that going to impact anything in terms of, uh, you know, a potential um, financial hit for the organization or um, some sort of, you know, potential impact to the relationship with that vendor, et cetera? Probably not. Now, if you were sending all invoices via fax and you know everything had to be done via fax then that would be a different story because it could potentially cause a, a breakdown in communication etc but if you're not having that process in your organization then if the fax number changes and you probably send out one fax a year in your organization and it might not necessarily be to this vendor don't track it so there isn't we have to get away from that I need to track everything and make that become more of what is it that I need to track and why and so we're going to talk about the four considerations for successful deployment and those considerations are setup, performance, reporting, and data management. And we're going to touch on every one of those topics through our, um, you know, through our presentation. Um, so if we talk about setting up audit trail, um, you know, the, the first and biggest question that you should um, ask is what should I track? So there needs to be ownership from every aspect of the organization. The business process owners need to be engaged to talk about what should be tracked. Um, and you have to understand that there's a cost to audit trails. And what we mean by that is there's a cost associated, not necessarily, you know, um, an actual um, num dollar amount that you can that you can put on there, but a cost as far as um, performance as far as who's going to be doing the reviews of the reports, um, you know, how many items are going to be set up and who's going to be looking at them, etc. So what we always say is you start with taking a risk-based approach, okay? That is going to be, first and foremost, um, you need to look at the risks in your organization. And when we talk about take a risk-based approach, we always use this example of two different um, clients of ours. And one of them, is a beer manufacturer and their risks are really centered around um, distribution, um, you know, product storage, movement of product between warehouses and, and trucks and stores and um, things like that. And so, uh, or even, you know, um, the materials that are going into the product, spoilage, etc. So their needs um, and what they're going to track is very different than another client of ours that is an online um, job posting website. Um, you know, they don't have a warehouse in the back with all these different job postings on racks and in bins. Um, you know, their, their uh, assets or collateral or, or um, products are um, intangible, right? So maybe their processes are, their risks are more around revenue recognition, um, cash management, um, you know, payables management, et cetera. So it's going to be a little bit different. So you have to really have a great understanding of your organization's risk, where the, uh, you know, where your risk profile is, where, um, you need to be tracking. Okay, so you want to start at reports. What reports are you going to be looking at? If you were to envision what a report should look like, you know, you can start off just sketching out rough information in, you know, in a shell to say, okay, these were these are the types of things that I have like to look at. Um, so, you know, maybe I'd like to look at inventory transfers, um, you know, who did them, when they did them, and, you know, was it an authorized transfer or something like that. Maybe I would like to look at vendor changes, but I'm only concerned with um, we're paying vendors by EFT, bank accounts and routing number changes, making sure that those are appropriate. Vendor check name if we're paying by checks, remit to addresses, where those checks are being sent, especially because that remit to address can change invoice by invoice um, within GP, right? So having an understanding as well as, um, you know, as to how the product functions. Um, you know, for example, in GP, you can set up a vendor address code, uh, a remit to address code on the vendor level, but it can change at the invoice level. So where do you want to track that? Because you can track it at the vendor level, um, but if somebody sets one up at the, on the fly because they have access to at the time of invoicing and sets it up for that invoice, you might want to track it at the invoice level as well. Right, so having an understanding of how the system works to understand where your risk areas might be um, and where you're going to start to, um, you know, where you're going to start to set up those tracking items, etc. If you're not going to review it, don't track it. 
this is very, very important. You're going to hear us say this um, over and over again. If you're going to create data with, the, with an audit trail tool and you're going to have all of these great reports but nobody is going to look at it, don't waste your money. Um, don't purchase the product, don't install a product, don't do it. Because the whole point of having audit trail data is that it's reviewed. And review that information timely. We had a, a case, um, there was a case where you know a prospect um, uh, had come to us and they had told us they were actually using an audit trail so solution, um, but no one looked at the data. And six months went by and they actually had some fraud happen in their organization. And the funny thing is that this the, the fraud was very well documented in the audit trail reports, which helped them, you know, during their prosecution of the individual and all of that, and for you know supporting information. But it didn't stop the fraud from happening because they didn't think to look at these reports, um, you know, daily or weekly or monthly or whatever, pro, you know, whatever period is appropriate for what it is that you're looking at. Um, so when they finally looked, you know, six to eight months later, when they saw some, you know, um, some. Uh, peculiarities in their in their financial reports it was too late um, and they didn't end up recovering all the assets but if they had you know if they had done their reviews in time and had actually looked at it uh, they would have been in much better shape so if you're you know the, the biggest key is reviewing if you're if it's something that you're not going to review don't track it and you know sometimes even if you start setting up audit trail information and you start reviewing the reports and you notice that there's fields being tracked that you every time you look at the report you're like I don't care about this I don't care about this go and amend your audit trail to remove that from being tracked so that you're not bogging down your reports with information that is not business critical okay so audit trails are should be they should always be a work in progress right they should always be evolving they should always be following what's happening in your business and if your business is changing your audit trail should be changing so those reviews help that um, evolution as well Right, because you start to see, well, I, you know, I don't necessarily need to look at this information, and you know, I really should be looking at this information, etc. So that tra that reviewing is very, very important. Um, engage the business process owners. Um, what we mean by that is, if you're looking at things centering around accounts payable, then you're going to want to engage the accounts payable manager and the controller. Is an IT person, um, if you put an IT person in charge of reviewing audit trail reports, are they going to know um, what is correct and what isn't correct and, you know, why a certain vendor is changing and, you know, what the per correct payment terms should be, etc.? Probably not. Um, you know, they might see certain red flags if the vendor check name all of a sudden says great on Edna for about 20 different vendors, then they might be able to say, you know, hey guys, you might want to review this. Um, but they don't understand necessarily the nuances of what happens in the individual department. So it's very important, very, very important that you engage the business process owners. You know, talk to them about what happens in their organization um, or in their particular department, um, what their concerns are. Um, you know, et cetera. They know the ins and outs better than somebody who's removed from the process would be. Okay. And then um, when you're talking about setting up, you know, identify the entity and then go all the way down to the fields. So, for example, if we want to track vendors, then identify the fields that are important on the vendors. If we want to talk about items, identify the fields that are important on the items. If we want to talk journal entries, right, if the concern is who's creating the journal entry versus who's posting it, you don't necessarily need to track all the debits and credits. You can run those reports from within GP. You can rerun a journal entry using your cross-reference report to see exactly what was posted, okay, um, but you can't necessarily see who posted it or you can't necessarily see, you can probably see who posted it with that user who posted field, but you can't necessarily see who created it and who edited it. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to get down to the nitty gritty of what was posted. So identify what is critical. Okay, um, and by doing that, when we talk about the next slide, which is um, the performance considerations, oops, sorry, went, went too far. Um, more that you work on having the you know only the critical areas and 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 making sure that you're setting up everything is going to 
help you with the performance considerations. So one of the biggest questions we always get asked is, what kind of a hit is my system going to take by implementing an audit trail solution? And that answer is very much, it depends, right? We would love to be able to say, well, you know, it's going to affect this, um, you know, this percentage of your resources or this or that, and we can't say that. Um, because there are so many different factors that go into it. And different products, right, function differently. So the main audit trail tools on the market for Dynamics GP all have a similar architecture in the fact that they put triggers on the database and they're tracking the information that way. But some of the tools have some coding in the front end that you know um, launches every time you launch GP, some don't, et cetera. So there are going to be variations and nuances depending on the product that you're using. But things to consider, every field tracked has an, a performance impact. The more fields, the more impact. And the reason is simple. When we talk about audit trails, generally, um, the three audit trail tools that are currently on the market that I know of, um, and even a lot of custom things that I've seen, are using triggers. And those triggers are placed on the columns in the databases for the information that you're tracking, or on the columns and the tables in the database for the, the information that you're tracking. So for example, if we were to talk vendor card, every, every field that you can type into on the vendor card has a corresponding column in the vendor master table, the PM00200 table. So every field that you would like to track, be it the check name, the payment term, et cetera, has that corresponding column, we would put a trigger on that, okay? So three triggers versus 70 triggers is gonna be a lot less performance impact, okay? Um, but if you start to say, well, I wanna audit the entire vendor card, you know, then we're talking the 70 triggers, that's where you start to get that, that you know, performance impact. Um, does the audit trail have an impact on user experience? Um, what we mean by that is some audit trail tools actually modify the Dynamics GP code so that when you lo log into GP, it's a launching the tool right from within GP. And that, you know, anytime you add additional code into a tool, anytime you add an, uh, an item into the dynamics.set file and you have to launch that product, it could cause a little bit of a lag. Um, so you want to maybe ask the question of, you know, does the, the audit trail solution that you're choosing to use um, have any impact like that in, in terms of installing and modifying code right in the front end of the system? Or is it simply a back end tracking tool, et cetera? Because that can um, determine some, you know, can have some performance impact. Um, you know, and tracking has an impact on report performance. Um, so we'll talk about this when we talk a little bit about examples of, you know, bad audit trail reports versus better audit trail reports. Um, if you're tracking, you know, we'll go back to the example of tracking three fields versus tracking 70. Um, let's say a vendor card changes five times, um, you know, or let's say you add five new vendors this week. Um, if you're tracking three fields, you have 15 rows in your report. If you're tracking 70 fields, you have 350 rows. Now imagine over the course of, you know, um, a week and a month and, you know, two months and six months, that grows exponentially, right? So when you're running your reports, it still has to search the database through all of those records that exist there, all of those rows. So now if your database is growing at a rate of, let's say, um, you know, 20 to 30 rows a week versus 350 to 400 rows a week, by the end of the year, your reports are gonna be slower if you're looking at all of those fields. It's gonna take longer for those reports to render, it's gonna take longer to get the information that you're looking for, and quite honestly, it's gonna take longer for the reviews to happen because your users have to sift through a lot more data, okay? So again, we're gonna go back to the, and, and this is gonna be the recurring theme, go back to the take a risk-based approach. Don't track things if they are unnecessary, if they don't fit into your risk matrix or your risk profile for your organization, um, because that will better your performance. Um, it will make things easier for the end users, et cetera. And the other thing that we always encourage is build a test environment. Um, you know, you can, um, hopefully, if you have the resources to actually have a completely separate 
test environment for um, you know like a, se a separate SQL Server instance and the whole nine yards. That's always the best thing to do um, because then you can um, do your testing without impacting any of your live um, you know your live servers or anything like that. But if you only have the ability to actually um, you know have a test company rather than a test um, environment. Um, and so your test company exists on the same uh, environment as your live companies, then before you deploy audit trail to your live companies, any type of audit trail solution, set it up on the test company first and see what the reports look like. See if, you know, log into that, um, you know, log into that test company and see if there's any kind of impact or even, you know, see if it's impacting anything that's happening in the live environment, et cetera. So, anything and you know and this is true of any kind of software implementation or anything at all you want to test test and test um, you want to make sure that before you deploy it and go live you have you have had adequate adequate testing time to make sure that um, you're not building any kind of performance issues into the tool etc and that you're still getting the information out of the system that you need to get um, to have the tool be worthwhile and have it provide information to you that works for your organization okay um, I want to talk for a minute about determining risk areas in an organization. Okay, so I mentioned it a little bit earlier. We talked about you know determining your organizational risk about you know different company profiles and how you know the beer manufacturer's risk profile is going to be completely different than the job posting um, you know organization, etc. So really, you know, have an understanding of what organizational risk you have, and then from there talk about your segregation of duties that you have in your organization. So a lot of times audit trails become uh, necessary when you don't have adequate segregation of duties. So if you're a relatively small organization um, and people have a lot of overlapping functions, so you know people that can handle cash receipts can also um, you know do write-offs and then they can you know do some other things within the system or a lot of people no, um, you know, a lot of people have power user functionality, or you have somebody, like I said, that can create vendors and that they can pay that vendor. You don't have those adequate segregation of duties. You're probably going to want audit trails somewhere in there to support and and kind of keep an eye on what's going on where you can't ad adequately segregate those duties. Now, if you have a user that can only, you know, that can create vendors and they can't do anything else within GP, you still want to probably use audit trail just to make sure that things are being, um, you know, things are being created correctly, but you might not have as much of a risk as, you know, because they can't do anything else. Now, there's always the risk of collusion that does exist, et cetera. So, you know, you do want to be cognizant of all of that. Um, but, you know, really audit trails is going to be used as support where you don't have adequate segregation of duties. So you want to have an understanding of your SOD um, potential risks and things like that in your organization. Um, and then you want to talk about outside controls. So, um, you know, if we go back to you know, the payables and, um, you know, uh, that functionality. If you're using things like safe pay and, um, you know, um, you're sending information to the bank of who's been paid and, you know, that information has to match up when somebody goes and tries to deposit or cash that check, et cetera, um, you know, you can mitigate some of your risk with outside controls. Um, so you don't, you know, you if there are things that you're already mitigating with outside controls, you don't have to duplicate your, um, you you know your risk mitigation efforts um, so you can be cognizant of those outside controls as well and help you determine a strategy for where audit trails are appropriate um, and then you know we we always talk about using a probability impact model and what I mean by that is you know you have areas that are high probability high dollar impact right so if something happens it can cause you know a real big issue in your organization and then you might have things that are very low probability but still high dollar impact and you might want to consider them um, and then you have the low probability low impact and you don't even bother with those areas right so you can kind of map out all of your different um, risk areas on that sort of a model and concentrate on those high probability high impact and maybe low probability but high dollar impact as well um, so you want to uh, you know maybe you want to 
use a model of that sort to be able to um, determine that. And then the other thing, obviously, is if there's any specific audit requirements um, that can, you know, that um, come about from either your internal or your external auditors, you want to be cognizant of that and, and maybe set up audit trails um, to support some of those audit requirements, right? We always want to be able to give the auditors what they're looking for. Um, so, you know, that comes into play when you're determining, like, what type of audit trails you might need to set up, et cetera, in your organization. Okay. Um, we want to talk about some potential, oops, sorry, we'll talk about reporting. Um, so let's talk about uh, some reporting um, challenges, et cetera, and, and the types of reports that you're going to look for out of an audit trail solution. Um, we don't want you to create your own haystack, okay? Again, that goes back to understanding what it is you want to audit, audit only the things that are important, um, you know, because if you if you build huge reports, um, you know, and you're looking at tens of thousands of rows of data, you're not going to find the things that are meaningful. They're not going to jump out at you. So it is going to be like searching for a needle in the haystack. So don't go, don't do that. Um, try to be as streamlined as possible. Um, determine who is going to be the reviewer. So this goes back to talking about engaging the business process owners. Who's going to be reviewing the information? Um, who's going to be the owner of that? How often are they going to review it? Um, so certain things should be probably reviewed daily, depending on the criticality of those items. Other things could be reviewed weekly. Other things could be monthly or quarterly. So determine the criticality of each area, um, and that you know, and and during your modeling, if it's high impact, high probability, those are probably things that you're going to want to review v much more often than things that are low probability, um, et cetera. So you want to determine those review periods, and then finally provide evidence of the reviews. So and that's for both internal, external audit um, requirements. And even just a good old-fashioned, you know, business requirements in your organization, good business practices. Um, if you know, if you can't provide sign-offs on those reviews to say yes, I've absolutely, I absolutely have reviewed it, then how do you know that the review has been done, right? So you want somebody to take responsibility of that and be able to provide evidence for those reviews. You want ownership over that process, right? Um, because the more ownership you have over that process, um, the more uh, probability that the the review is going to be done completely and correctly and you're going to be um, able to head off any potential problems way before they're starting and then what are you looking for in a report you want to make sure you have the who the what the when the where and the how and what we mean by that is who's making the change and surrounding that who is that person the appropriate person so do we have security setup issues within Dynamics GP um, the what is being changed. Is what is being changed appropriate? Is it necessary? Um, is it valid? When are they doing it? Um, are things being changed during the course of normal business hours? Or are you all of a sudden seeing things change at odd hours? 3 a.m., non-working hours, holidays, etc. Why is that happening? Now, there could be very good reasons. Maybe there's a process that's being done an update and, and you know it's a it's a mass update and you want to do it off peak um, or there's some maintenance that needs to be done or things like that. Not a problem. Um, but if it's something that you know kind of is an inappropriate change and it's happening happening at inappropriate hours, um, you know, it, it lends itself to questions why are these changes being done at this time, what's going on, etc. Where and how relates to are the changes coming from within Dynamics GP and or are they coming from an outside source? And if they are coming from an outside source, how? Who has access to the system at that level? Is that access appropriate? Did we know that these users had access to the system at that level? So um, what you should hope for is that your audit trail tool has the ability to give you these items, to give you the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how. Um, because that is going to ensure completeness, that is going to make sure that you have a good picture of what is happening in your audit trails. Okay, And then if we talk about um, data maintenance, um, you know, you want to go back to how much data is going to be created and that, you know, goes back to performance impact. Um, 
we have some uh, models as far as how, how this works, but you can extrapolate out, you know, how many fields versus how many um, records are being changed a month, potentially. You should be able to pull some stats out of your system, you know, how many vendors you create or modify on a monthly basis, how many journal entries get created, um, things like that, and you can kind of extrapolate out how many rows of data that would end up creating in an audit trail. Um, situation and we say um, in our tool specifically but I think it's it's semi-universal but our tool specifically for every million rows of data you're creating a gig of database space okay so um, you can kind of extrapolate out how much data you're going to be creating on a monthly basis on an annual basis etc to use just kind of as a rule of thumb um, you know for 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 um, modeling purposes and making sure that you know you have enough server space and um, you know your server performance is okay um, but one of the things that you're going to want to be able to do is to define a retention policy how much audit trail data do you need to retain and for how long um, you know audit trail data could have potentially different retention policies than financial data um, it's not like you need to save it for tax purposes or things like that so if you're you know if you work with your internal or external auditors or your you know your finance team or whoever to determine a retention policy um, then abide by it you know, purge, the, archive the data and purge it on a regular basis. Um, archiving data would, will definitely improve report performance. So if you need to keep the data in case you ever need to go back and run a historical report, do that, but find a way to archive it so that your current reports, the ones that you're running daily, weekly, and monthly, are running much quicker. You know, you, you, you don't want to have lags in report performance because it has to go and search three to four years of historical data if you have the ability to archive it. Okay, and then purge the data on a regular basis based on that archive, or that retention policy that you create. Um, and as always, make a backup. I mean, before you do anything, um, before you you know archive or purge, make backups. Um, have that available somewhere in case you ever need it. Um, but at least this way, you can optimize the performance um, with a good data maintenance plan to help you um, you know not have so much performance impact. So performance impact and data maintenance kind of go hand in hand. Um, and then we talk about uh, the pitfalls of audit trails. So I already talked about I want to audit everything as being a huge pitfall. Okay, don't do it. I mean, and if somebody says I want to audit everything, push back really, really hard. Because I know that we have people on the phone that might not necessarily be the decision makers as to what is finally audited but they're the ones that are in charge of actually configuring the audits and things like that or vice versa you might you might have the the um, you know decision makers on but not the people that are actually doing the configuration please just remember I want to audit everything is never ever ever a good answer and I, we have had customers call us and say you know we've made a huge mistake um, we've set up way too much stuff to be audited. Our system is pretty much crippled. Please help us. Um, so, you know, I want to audit everything is something we never, ever, ever, ever want to hear. Go back to the risk profile of your organization. Go back to your business critical areas. Go back to where you don't have adequate segregation of duties. And really challenge the questions of, what are you going to do with you know all of this information if you want to audit everything who's going to look at it and I bet you no one will volunteer and put their hand up and say "Ooh, pick me I want to do this I want to go through all of this data okay um, and again it's like I said before if no one is going to review it don't bother tracking it because it's audit trail data is only as good as the reviews you perform on it and so if I want to audit everything turns into all this data that nobody is looking at you just threw money out the window so don't do that um, using audit trail tool audit, audit trail reports as a substitute for operational or financial reports never a good idea we don't want to build redundancy goes back to that performance impact it goes back to reviewing information. If you can get the information out of GP in either a smart list or a report, or you already have a reporting tool built to you know, get information on certain things, inventory counts, inventory locations, um, you know, how many write-offs have been done, how many um, you know, sales orders exist that are open, and you know, things like that. Don't use audit trail report to replicate operational and financial reports. 
it's it's not a wise idea it causes issues with performance um, and really it's not what the audit trail is intended for an audit trail report should never be a substitution for an operational or financial report um, and and your auditors will will agree with that point they're not going to um, you know want an audit trail report now you know there could be it could be support for specific operational and financial reports that already exist as to how the data made it to those reports but don't recreate reports that already exist with the audit trail module um, and then inefficient audit reports or what I call the 500 versus a million and that goes back to the I want to audit everything um, so when you talk about setting up reports and we're gonna and I'm gonna show you some examples of this um, in just a few minutes we're actually going to look a little bit at um, product setup um, when we talk about looking at you know an audit trail report and looking at 500 rows of data on that audit trail report versus a million again you're not going to have a volunteer that's going to stand up and say hey give me that million rows of data I'm going to look at it they're going to be cross-eyed within a half an hour and then what happens is that's when important information starts to get skipped it's very easy to see an anomaly or something that is kind of incorrect or maybe stands out as something that could potentially be harmful in a small report but when you bury it in a very very large report it's much harder to find um, so inefficiency in audit reports is what leads to problems not being discovered for a very long time and as you know we know that can be very detrimental to an organization okay so you want to make sure that when you're going through those reports um, and you've you've done your setup you you're always tweaking that setup you're always saying hey you know there's fields that I'm capturing here that nobody is looking at they're not really important we've deemed them as really not critical let's go back and let's clean up our audit trail setup so they're not showing up on these reports okay um, so just be careful of that that it that will cause you issues um, with your audit trail tool now um, the options for audit trail within Dynamics GP um, out of the box you have some things that are being tracked like the last user that did something or the last change date so if you look at um, I think uh, in GP for vendor you have modified last modified date created date and then last user who modified right it doesn't give you the iterations of the changes though um, but you can at least still see you know who when it was created and maybe the last user that changed it you don't necessarily know what they changed but you do have that um, or if you look at journal entries it will tell you the user who posted now it won't tell you who created it won't tell you who edited it but it will tell you the last user who posted it things like that so that is what you get out of the box um, as far as native audit trail though within GP there is nothing there is no module that you can configure for an audit trail tool um, it's not like you can um, you know have a separate module that you can then turn on audit trail or tracking there is some activity activity tracking in GP um, that you can use for security purposes like you know login to track logins and logouts um, or track access to windows um, or you know failed access you know failed attempts to access a window so if somebody's trying to access a vendor card um, and they shouldn't have access to it you can see who's tried to do that and who's failed etc um, but as far as native audit trails there is nothing in GP um, you can build custom audit trail solutions uh, you know we've seen this um, you know some customers have maybe a development um, team in-house or maybe they work with developers etc and they can build a custom audit trail application and you certainly can um, still be aware of all of the things presented in this presentation as far as you know um, how much information you're actually gathering what kind of performance impacts etc you're putting on the system um, and take that into consideration and then there are third-party options and um, you know FastPath does have an audit trail tool there are two others on the market as well um, by Rockton and Merit Solutions and if there are yet others your partners should know about that um, I'm those are the only three that I am currently aware of but we know that the GP landscape changes all the time so there could be a, you know could, could potentially be others um, but as of right now those are the three that I know about and again everything that I've talked about you know this isn't really um, you know I, I, I'm not trying to be product specific for a reason because you know this isn't really about how to set up fast path audit trail but really any audit trail in general right these are just good takeaways to have when you're talking about auditing in general so um, you know we do have those options and then one of the things that we're always asked about is um, 
notifications and um, being able to get that information. There we go. Um, alerts, you know, being able to get the notification um, for the uh, for the tool uh, or for audits as they're happening, you know, people want immediate notification. Um, depending on how those alerts are set up, there are some limitations. Um, number one, if there's a high volume of alerts and you're getting pinged every five seconds and you're trying to do your work, you're going to start ignoring those alerts. Okay, um, it's when you know when you're going through the course of your day and you have things to do, um, you know, and all of a sudden you're getting pinged because somebody, you know, you, you wanted to get an alert anytime um, somebody changed a vendor card, but you know, this week we just happen to have a lot of vendors, and you're getting the, you know, those alerts constantly. You're going to start to ignore them, um, and you know, depending on how they're set up, if they're coming through as emails and you have them, you have alerts set up for everything, you could flood your email server, so you could have exchange problems. So you want to be very careful with alerts. You want to um, understand, you know, and maybe set them up only when they're specifically necessary um, you know and very critical uh, you know maybe an EFT bank account changed or something like that um, and it's you know and you know that you cut payments every Thursday and so maybe you want to see that only on Thursdays or something like that you know so try to be careful of when you decide to use alerts in your environment if they are even available with the, the, the audit trail tool that you're using um, because you know what happens is if you're going to just ignore the alerts then it's just like creating the audit trail data and nobody doing the reviews no point to that okay and then again you don't want to cause issues if you're getting the alerts via email you don't want to cause issues with your exchange and just having too many emails and bogging down the system and things like that so be careful with the alerts um, what I'm gonna do very quickly is I'm actually gonna shift over to our audit trail tool for a second um, I want to go ahead and um, <clears throat> just talk a little bit about the um, here we go the setup and and talk about some you know bad audit trail reports versus some better ones and and go through some examples and so if I log into um, our audit trail tool and I'm not going to spend too much time here because like I said this is not a demo or anything like this this is just really talking about best practices and I'm just going to launch into one of our company databases. Um, I do want to just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, what the best way to go ahead and, um, uh, you know, take a look at data is. And, and this is really kind of universal. So I know I'm logging into the FastPath tool, but again, um, you know, I want you to look at this as, a, you know, a semi-universal type thing. So if we take a look at, you know, setting up some audits. Um, I have an audit set up on my checkbook master. I was having an issue with um, you know the checkbook uh, my duplicate check numbers being used and my reconciliation of my checkbook ended up starting to become a mess and then I was having issues with positive pay um, because you know the the check numbers were being duplicated and so when they were going to present the checks it wasn't matching up to you know the the check name and the check amount um, because on, you know on the same day we could have had two checks with the same check number and things like that and so that was causing major issues so I wanted to track how that was happening because the checkbook was supposed to have been set up to not allow duplicate check numbers and not allow overwriting the check number at time of printing the check so um, what I did was I came into my checkbook master my CM00100 table and if I expand this table you'll see and I hope the resolution is okay. I know it might be a little bit small, and for that I apologize. Um, but you can see that for this specific table, I have a, quite a number of fields. I mean, I think I have something like 40 or 50 fields in this table. Okay, but I've only selected to audit seven of them. That's all. That is all that is critical to me. So I have my bank ID, the checkbook ID, the currency ID, because I'm using a multi-currency environment, and so if that changes, that can cause a lot of problems. Um, and then I'm looking at whether or not we're allowing duplicate check numbers, whether or not the checkbook is being set to inactive, what the next check number is, and overriding the check number. And now this is where I'm going to kind of talk about, you know, um, doing those tweaks to go back and modify the audits to make sure that they're appropriate. What I found when I actually went into the report for um, my checkbook master, 
So I'm going to go ahead and launch into our reporting side so we can take a look at the audit reports that um, resulted from this is when I was tracking that next check number it wasn't necessary it wasn't really necessary because I wasn't really looking to see what check number they had changed it to I was really more concerned with the fact that they were changing the um, information to um, allow for duplicates and so um, when I looked at the checkbook report so I'm going to go into my GP checkbook change report now, all of a sudden, um, and let me just push the period back here a little bit. What I was seeing is, instead of the information that I was supposed to be seeing, I was seeing the next, um, I, I didn't have my, my audit set up correctly, actually, the first time. So I just was seeing that next checkbook number change. And so that was the only field that I was tracking at the time. I wasn't tracking um, the other fields that I have selected now. And so it was really confusing because that checkbook number, while I could see it being changed um, you know, from 2058 or 258 to 259 and then back to 2058 and then back again, and I can see it was being done multiple times, what I wasn't seeing is that could just simply be Snook actually printing checks. Um, and then somebody else could actually be doing the reversion, the revisions and the changes. And so I wasn't capturing the right information. So what I, what I did was I went back to my audit trail and I made sure that I selected these additional columns. Now I didn't go back subsequently and do any additional changes, but one of the things I note right now is I really don't need that, what that next check number is because anytime I do a check run, now if I'm running a hundred checks, I'm going to get a hundred rows in that report. So I don't want that. So I'm actually going to take that field off. So it's really a matter of going through and constantly, you know, being aware of the information that you're trying to collect, constantly being aware of what it is that you're gathering, how it's working, and, and looking at that and to do those revisions, right? Um, and then if we go back to look at the, um, if we go back and we look at some of the other reports as well, so I just redid my triggers there. Um, you know, we talk about the who, the what, the when, and the where. So I'm going to look at my um, open and close GL account report. And again, I'm going to backdate this a little bit. And um, what I'm going to see is that I have, you know, some accounts that have been added. And I have, um, let me just make some of these columns a little bit smaller so that we can see the application here. Um, and I apologize, the resolution on this monitor isn't the greatest, so I'm so sorry about that. Um, but I want to be able to show you the um, application number. So I see here changes that are, or the application name. So I see here changes that are happening where I can see that that change is happening in Microsoft Dynamics GP. But now, all of a sudden, I'm seeing changes that are happening in Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. So I can see the old value, the new value, um, the what was changed, this was an account description that was changed, it was an update here, so I can see this um, event type, it's actually an update, the date, the time, um, the user, so it was FP test Snook. Um, so what I see is that Snook has access to Dynamics GP from the front end because he actually added this GL account. So now why is he going into Microsoft SQL Server and updating that account via SQL, right? that lends itself to a lot more questions. First of all, why isn't the account description just being changed right from within the application? You know, is there a reason, was there a problem with the system that day? Do we have any kind of um, backup to support that? Number two, did I know that this user actually had backend access to the database? What else are they doing with this access to the database? Because that's pretty dangerous. Um, you know, if they have the ability to actually update tables in the database, how did, you know, did I know that they have that access? What else are they doing with that access, et cetera? So you want to try to have as much completeness in your audit trail reports as possible, right? Because then it gives you the information as to, you know, who is making these changes and it lends itself to really gaining an understanding of how, all the potential risks that you have in your system based on the access that users have, et cetera. 
Okay, um, so you know this is a, a good example of you know completeness, and because if we just saw an account description being changed without having the application information, right? If the report just kind of cut off at user, and we just saw that okay, this user went in and changed the account description, no big deal. We probably wouldn't ask any additional questions. We probably wouldn't even think twice about it. But now, seeing that the change is happening in SQL, it, we're going to think a lot harder about this change and why it's happening. Okay, so completeness of information is huge when you're doing audit trail reviews, right? Um, it becomes very, very important to have a, a, a good understanding of where all of this information is coming from. So with that being said, um, I'm going to end the, uh, the, the webinar here and leave a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, this material, uh, the webinar is being recorded. This material is going to be available. And if you have any additional questions or comments or concerns or anything like that, um, I'm going to go ahead and put up um, our contact information so you can go ahead and contact us. Um, you can find us on our website. You can follow us on Twitter. And I'm sorry, that Twitter is actually just at GoFastPath and not at GoFastPath.com. I apologize. Um, or you can email us. Um, you can email me directly, uh, email our info um, address, however you want to contact us. Um, and if there's anything else, any additional information that you need or anything that you would like to go more in depth on or anything like that, please feel free to reach out and we can, you know, I can set up one-on-one -on -one sessions with you guys and answer any questions that you might have or kind of go through um, the tools or anything at all. I mean, we're always more than happy to share our experience and, and um, you know, speak with you and give you any assistance that we possibly can. So Trish, um, I'm going to turn it back over to you if you have some final comments or if we have questions. Sure thing. <clears throat> Sorry. Again, um, feel free to raise your hand and we'll go ahead and unmute you if you have any questions. Um, let's see, we'll just give everybody one second here and see if we have anything in the queue. Um, otherwise, um, let's, I'll thank everybody for attending today. Um, like Liz mentioned, we did record this session and we will